Mr. Clark. Such a standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion in the following terms that the Senate notes that the Labor Party has rewarded the architect of the recession and the principal cause of, mis of the misery being suffered by 900,700 unemployed Australians and their families right. with the highest office of government, and two, is of the view that in recognition of such appalling judgment, the 19th of December shall be forthwith known as a national day of shame. Mr Deputy President, it is incredible that, this, that the once great Labor Party the once great Labor Party would reward the architect of the recession, the architect of the recession, the person principally responsible for nearly one million unemployed Australians and all of the misery being suffered by them and their families, of another 500,000 who have given up looking for work who are underemployed, 31 per cent of young, young, young Australians unemployed looking for work unsuccessfully. It is amazing that the person principally responsible for this shocking state of affairs in this nation would be rewarded by this government and given the office of Prime Minister. It is important, therefore, that this motion be debated tonight, because the consequences to Australia of what will follow is too horrible to contemplate. This was the man who claimed to know it all economically. This was the man who basically designed the recession. This is the man who claimed credit for the recession. He was the man who said this was the recession we had to have. He was the one who gave us interest rates well beyond that of our competitors, who gave us inflation rates well beyond that of our competitors, who designed, who designed the J-curve, all of these other exotic economic expressions, and basically produced an economic environment in which so much misery and suffering has resulted. And what does he get for that achievement? The Labor Party makes him Prime Minister, throws out their successful Prime Minister who had won four separate elections, gives him the reward of being booted out while still in office and puts into office the principal architect of the recession, the person responsible for the horrible state of affairs that exists in this country at the moment. How could that occur? How could these people be so silly? How could they not find a third party if they are sick and tired of Mr Hawke? How could, they put, how could they put Mr Keating before the Australian people as a credible Prime Minister in the light of his economic record and the suffering that he has caused? As a result of that, Mr Deputy President, we are of the view that this day will be a day known in the history of Australia. It will be a day known as a day of shame. It will be a day known when the judgment of the Labor Party was finally recognised that the appalling state that it's in and the consequences that Australia is going to suffer as a result of it is too great to, uh, to contemplate. So I move, this, I move this motion as a matter of, as a matter of regret. We don't understand. We don't understand how the Labor Party could have been as foolish as this. They deserve to be thrown out of office. They've demonstrated tonight that they deserve to be thrown out of office, and the sooner they're thrown out of office, the better. Order. There will be order on my left. <laughs> there will be order on my left. Senator Richardson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy order. President. Order. Now, I, uh, or, order. Oh, sir. I. I will not call for order again. I will take action. <laughs> Senator Richardson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. It, uh, it disappoints me that, uh, that if, uh, if the opposition was serious, Mr. Deputy President, about uh, a resolution such as this, we'd have got more than a two-and-a-half-minute speech from the leader. I'd have thought that if this was really all that uh, it is cracked up to be, we got two-and-a-half of you. Mind you, that's about all you're capable of. None of us are surprised. You, could, you couldn't go three minutes unless you had it written by your staff. You wouldn't know how. 
I warned Senator Hill, I warned Senator McGibbon, I warned Senator uh, Kemp. I, uh, I had a thought. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I had a thought, Mr. Deputy President, that uh, if we were really serious, we'd have got more than two and a half minutes. Mind you, I just don't think Senator Hill's capable of it. Now we're given uh, we're given two lines here. First is the rewarding of the architect of the recession. Now I uh, I find that an interesting uh, an interesting phrase for uh, the Senate to be uh, debating tonight. I can recall that there was a certain Dr Hewson who used to give advice. He used to give advice to a former government. Now, you'd all recall that government. Some of you were members of it. Now, I wonder what happened while he gave advice. He gave the economic advice that gave us double-digit inflation, that gave us double-digit interest rates, that gave us double-digit unemployment. He got the trifecta up. Dr Hewson got the trifecta up. No chance of that now, none whatsoever. But what did you reward him with? You rewarded him with the leadership of your party. No one, no one in the Labor Party can even seek to emulate those kinds of achievements. No one can even bother, and we won't. I, uh, Senator Calvert. I, I'm not sure. You, all you've just shown me, Senator, Senator Jesus, Calvert, you've washed your hands, or that you've given up. One of the two. One of the two. You've washed your hands, or you've given up. Either way, I'm happy. Either way, I'm happy. It shows a change. If it's, if it's the former, it shows a change in personal habits. Order, if it's order. Senator Calvert, I've called you to order three times. I warn you. I, uh, Mr. President, uh, I, I, won't, uh, I won't continue to answer Senator Teague's uh, uh, gesticulations. I would, however, suggest that uh, the idea of this uh, rewarding the Arctic the recession really is nonsense. The second part, though, the second part, the second part really, really shows what we've got. The second part of this resolution refers to the National Day of Shame. Now, I reckon, I reckon, with even just a half a dozen government senators, if we'd been able to sit around for three weeks thinking about this, we might have come up with a better line than a National Day of Shame. I reckon we'd have just about done a bit better. That is pathetic. I mean, at least we expect better theatre from you, if nothing else. Ham off the bone does not do it justice. Does not do it justice, Senator Collins. So I, uh, I would, I would have thought that you'd have done a lot better, a lot better than just a national day of shame. But I tell you what, you will get over the course of uh, the next uh, 16 months, 18 months. What, you, what you will get, what you will get is what you don't want. What you'll get is a drubbing day after day after miserable day, day after day, a drubbing of massive proportion. I mean, you'll all recall. It's only Order. a few months. You'll all recall. Order. I had warned Senator Kemp. I named Senator Kemp. I invite Senator Kemp to, to uh, make an explanation uh, to you, Mr. That's bad advice. No, this is the normal. I'm going through what. Order. The normal procedure, Senator. We don't need your puerile assistance, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, I ask you to invite uh, Senator Kemp to uh, make some act of contrition there, and uh, so we don't have to take this matter any further. That's what you do. Uh, could I seek, <laughs> seek your guidance, uh, Mr. Deputy President? Uh, uh, what, on, on what basis was I named? Se Senator Kemp, you were, you were warned of disorderly behaviour on a number of occasions, and because of your continued disorderly behaviour, I warned you, and then you continued to, after some time, you started interjecting again, and that was done after a warning. Now, in accordance with Standing Order 203, I call upon Senator Kemp to make an explanation or an apology. The reason uh, that I think you named me, Mr Deputy President, was that, was that I was laughing. And I regret to say, Mr Deputy President, that I was laughing loud. And I was laughing along with a lot of my colleagues. And I have to say, I have to say that I found it very hard to stop laughing, Mr Dep De Deputy President, because uh, in view of the comments that the Speaker was making at that time, I have to say also 
uh, I, I feel it rather, rather surprising in the context of uh, the noise that there was in the chamber that uh, you chose to single me out. And uh, I would appreciate a clearer reason why I happen to have been singled out, but you are quite right, I was laughing. And I suspect, Mr Deputy President, I was laughing loud and I suspect that I would have been laughing long in view of the comments that I had heard. I am not aware, I am not aware that laughter is a um, disorderly act. Uh, if it is, uh, can I say to you, Mr, Mr. De De Deputy President, uh, I will certainly try to control myself uh, more fully in the future. Uh, but I have to say that, uh, uh, in view of uh, the way we were being uh, provoked by, by Sen Sen Senator Richardson, that I did find, uh, find it difficult. And uh, that's the reason for my behaviour. I do not think, in the context of what has happened today, and the context of what the Labor government has done to Mr Hawke, right, right. that it is a very serious act. In fact, in the context of what has happened today, it is a very minor act. But you are right. I was laughing. I was laughing loud. And I was laughing at Senator Richardson. Yeah. Order. 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 Senator Kemp, I ask you to make an explanation and an apology. You have made an explanation. Do you make an apology for your um, the, apology. Do you make an apology? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Acting President. O order. Mr. Acting President. O order. Order. Mr. Acting President. O order. Yes, he's made an explanation or an apology. Um, yes, Senator um, Archer. Um, Mr. Acting President. Um, firstly, you did not ask for an apology. Right. And secondly, um, Standing Order 203 says, one, if a senator persistently and willfully obstructs the business of the Senate, which Senator Kemp did not do, b, is guilty of disorderly conduct, which Senator Kemp did not do, c, uses objectionable words and refuses to withdraw those such words, which Senator Kemp did not do, D. Persistently and willfully well, refuses to conform to the standing orders, which Senator Kemp did not do. E. Persistently and willfully regards the authority of the chair, which Senator Kemp did stop not do. The president may here. report to the Senate that the senator has committed an offence. If you could control those jackals on the other side, we'd get on quicker. Order. You're on the point of order. If an offence has been committed by a senator in the committee of the whole, the chairman may suspend the proceedings and so on. There's nothing in there which indicates that Senator Kemp has committed any offence to the chair or to the chamber. None at all. Mr. Mr. Acting President, I would ask you to read 203 yourself, and I would certainly support Senator Kemp in that he has committed no offence. And I, I believe that certainly Senator Richardson was doing his best to provoke the opposition in any way he could, and he did. And, I, and nobody would, would dispute that. And uh, Mr. Mr. Acting President, I just ask you to review uh, what you have said and what you have demanded of, the, uh, of, of my colleague, Senator Kemp. Oh, 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 order. Um, S Senator McMillan. Point of order as well, uh, Mr. Deputy President. I I think everybody would, un well, everybody except possibly uh, from what he's just said, Senator Archer, would understand that which led you to uh, uh, be concerned about the constant interjections to issue, uh, which quite clearly on this occasion and on other occasions uh, have uh, constituted persistently and willfully obstructing the business of the Senate, being in that event at, at someone trying to speak to a motion that some people at least thought it was important. The people, on the, the people who are actually interjecting in, indicated they thought it was important. So I think there wasn't any doubt that those circumstances were the sort of provocation that would lead someone in the chair to consider the action which you took and which reasonably led you to it. And were it not... And it, I've, I've, actually, I've actually just referred exactly to the words, Senator Archer, and uh, I've also, I'm also aware of the precedent in the way in which they are used and have been used in the past. 
And Mr. Quite straightforwardly, but Mr Deputy President, were it not for uh, the nature of uh, the uh, explanation uh, given by Senator Kemp, which uh, I thought I heard him say uh, that he apologised, uh, and Senator Collins thought I heard the same, but certainly was tantamount to was tantamount, uh, I thought, to that. And were it not for that, I would have thought you might have been you would have been justified in proceeding further under the standing orders. But I certainly defend the initial decision which you made. And were it not for the explanation uh, given by Senator Kemp, I think you would have been justified in seeking to take further action. So I speak to the standing order raised by Senator Archer and suggest we get on with the business. Senator Calder. Mr. Deputy President. Um, when Senator Archer uh, spoke on this uh, point of order, he seemed to be implying that the various clauses under 2031 were um, uh, connected through the, uh, the word and. The clauses stand quite separately, and uh, any one of those clauses being fulfilled satisfies, satisfies the requirement of 203. And it is made absolutely clear in D where the word or appears. And, uh, I would, support, I would support what Senator McMullen has said, and the, the condition has been fulfilled. The uh, part three then goes on and says that um, the senator um, be called upon to make an apology or explanation. We have heard an explanation. We have not heard an apology. But it then goes on, and then a motion may be moved that a senator be suspended, and I forthwith move that uh, Senator Kemp be suspended. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Order. 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 Resume, sir. Order. Senator Coulter, there was uh, a great deal of uh, background noise. Did I? Could I ask you? Um, what you, uh, in fact, said. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Deputy uh, President. Uh, in accordance with the second part of clause three of 203, I'm, mo I'm, moving, I'm moving the motion that the senator be suspended. And I would remind you, Mr. Uh, Deputy President, that no amendment, adjournment, or debate shall be entered into, and that therefore the motion should be put forthwith. Order, order. I have a motion before the chair, and and. and Order. I have a motion before the chair, and no amendment. Order. I will raise a fresh point. You will, order. You will take a seat when, this, when the chair is standing. No amendment, adjournment, or debate is allowed on such a motion, and it's to be put immediately by the person in the chair. I therefore put. I put. I put the question, moved by Senator Calder. That Senator Coulter's motion be agreed to. Those, those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Point of order, Mr. Deputy President. I am putting the question. Mr. Deputy President, I, you put the question. You asked, you asked Senator Coulter when other people were on their feet. I will put. Order! I'll put the question. Uh, the question is that Senator Coulter's motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The country no. No. I think the ayes have it. No. no. Divisions required. Ring the bell.
lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Colter be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Jones teller for the ayes, Senator Brownhill teller for the noes. With those honourable senators, there is a there is a division in place. Would honourable senators take their seats? The result of the division being eyes 33, nose 32. The chamber will come to order. 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 The Senator Kemp is accordingly suspended from the sitting of the Senate for the remainder of the sitting. Senator Hill's motion be agreed to. 
Senator uh, Boswell. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I believe the uh, or whatever. I believe the uh, motion deserves support. Here we have tonight one of a, a night of infamy for the for the Labor Party, a night of desperation, where they have tried to throw out a leader that has won them four elections on the trot, four elections, and in a desperate stand to gain to gain. Yes, they are sitting there laughing, and they've destroyed a man that has won four elections at a trot for them in a desperate effort, in a desperate effort to gain popularity. Order, order, Mr. Acting Deputy. And to Megan, should be heard in silence. And, uh, Name, please, Mr. Mr. Deputy President. S S Senator O'Chi, if you like to try frivolous points of order like that, I will deal with you as well. S point of order. Senator Boswell. On a point of order. Senator Boswell. On a point of order. What is your point of order? Mr. Mr. Deputy President, the people on that side are laughing as loud as Senator Kemp was laughing before. And it is very clearly the case that the, the rules of this chamber, I respectfully submit to you, have to be applied fairly and equally. And if we're going to have laughter from that side, then I suggest they should be named as well. Senator Boswell. Deputy President, what I was saying is a, a night that will be remembered as a disgrace to the Labor Party, where they have thrown out a Prime Minister that has won four elections on a trot in a desperate effort to regain popularity with the Australian people. And I can tell them now that it is an act of desperation that will have no value in it. You have replaced a man that could lead with a man that is more unpopular than him with anyone in the Labor Party. And you've taken this act because you think you'll just throw him off the sleigh and you'll win popularity again. Mr. Senator Boswell should address the issue before the chair, which is the suspension of standing orders. He's uh, attempting to address a substantive issue, which is not before the House. And he's... The... No, it's, there is a... no, it's not. There is a. Uh, Senator Boswell. Uh, Thank you, the... Mr. Acting the, the, Deputy the, the, Chairman. The, the, what I, I, I am doing. Senator is... Boswell, I uphold the point of order. You continue. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. But what I am doing is trying to address the, the uh, motion before the House tonight that, uh, that one that. Uh, Senator Hill introduced, and it needs to be debated. This man that has wrought havoc, this previous treasurer that has order, order. The time for um, the time has expired for the, uh, the the debate. I put the I put Senator Hill's motion for suspension of standing orders. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. A division is required. Ring the bells.
order. Order. There are too many dejections from both sides. Lock the doors. The question is that the suspension of standing orders motion moved by Senator Hill be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Brownhill teller for the eyes and Senator Jones teller for the nose. Order. Result of the division there being 30 ayes and 35 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Would all senators please resume their seats? Order. Mr Clark. I seek leave to move a motion of no confidence in the Deputy President. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr President, I move that the Senate has no confidence in the Deputy President. I move, I move this, uh, this motion with regret, Mr President. I move, I, move, I, I, move it, I move it with regret. Order. Order. There will be no interjections. Senator Hill. It's not the first time the Deputy President has lost the confidence of this side of the chamber, but it's the first time that we have taken, taken this action. And we've taken it because of the extraordinary action of the Deputy President tonight. I've been now here for 10 years 
and apart from on one occasion late at night due to an <laughs> unfortunate mixture of circumstances, Drinks. nobody I, no. 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 that's no. offensive no. to Senator Walters. No. No person has Order. been no person has been named. Senator Kemp on our side. Senator 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 Kemp was named tonight, it seems, because he laughed. Well, what was it? He was, he was named Order. because he laughed. In an environment where Order. he was Senator Hill's got the call. in an environment where he was more than entitled to laugh, as he said himself, he had every reason to laugh at the presentation of Senator Richardson. He had every reason to laugh at the behaviour of the Labor Party today. How is laughing disorderly in terms of Standing Order 203? Is it persistently and willfully obstructing the business of the Senate? No one can say that Senator Kemp did that. Is it disorderly conduct? Surely it's not disorderly conduct within the normal meaning of that expression. It's certainly not objectionable words. He's certainly not willfully refusing to conform with the standing orders. And he's not willfully disregarding the authority of the chair by laughing at Senator Richardson. It is well within reason of what can be fairly expected in a debate of this nature in this chamber. The truth is, Mr President, the Deputy President lost control and saw the only way of getting himself out of that difficulty was to throw someone out. That is not the level of performance that the Senate should be entitled to expect from the Deputy President. As I've said, Mr President, it is in the light of other circumstances that have occurred in recent times where this side of the chamber has been particularly unhappy with his performance. But we haven't moved in this way because it's not obviously not a course of action that we would desire to take. But tonight it is beyond all sense of reason and we therefore see that we have no alternative but to take this action. And I therefore move, as I said, that the Deputy President no longer have the confidence of this chamber. Yeah. Senator Button, uh, we're entering a difficult time uh, in the pre-Christmas period when there is a lot of business for the Senate to be conducted and uh, a lot of parties are being conducted outside, I guess, and that, that uh, makes it... Point of order, Mr President. Point of order. I don't, I don't want to embellish the point of order I'm about to make, but there was an occasion in the old parliament where Senator Button alleged that I member of the Liberal Party was found drunk on the lawn and it took months and months and months for him to withdraw and apologise. Now I hope he's not again making an assertion of a very discolourful nature which reflects improperly upon members on our side. Now whether the Labor Party themselves have been imbued with a sense of disaster or ecstasy, I don't know. But I ask that he withdraw any imputation on members on this side. Uh, order. Well, you'd be one to talk. You'd be one to talk. Order. Order. <coughs> order. Order. I'm not going to let this get out of control. I heard Senator Button say, make a reference to parties. I don't think he said a reference to a party on any particular side of the chamber, and that's why I did not take offence. <laughs> order. Uh, thank you, thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President, for your ruling. I made no reference to any political party. Senator Crichton Brown rose in a manner which uh, reminded me of the cap fitting, and uh, <coughs> a, point, a point of order, Mr. A point of order, Mr. President. Order, order, the, order. Senator Crichton Brown, look, there are, there are too many unparliamentary remarks coming from behind you. Well, Mr. Now, I think this should be Mr. a Pre reasonable debate. Mr. President, with respect, it's not for me to make judgments about the, the unparliamentary points that would have been made behind me or comments. But can I say it's always regrettable when Senator Button gets back into a corner where you have this vicious, right. nasty little right. comment that seems to flow so freely from his mouth. Now, can I say with respect, if he continues to reflect improperly upon the integrity and the conduct of members on this side, you, sir, with respect, will continue to get proper points of order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Senator Button. Uh, I made no reflection in the remarks which I made on members of the opposition. And uh, if, you're, if anybody is sensitive about that, I again repeat, I made no remarks which reflected exclusively on the opposition. Now let me say, uh, Mr. Mr. President, uh, we're, we're reaching the uh, end of the, uh, uh, the session of the parliament, and uh, of course there is uh, business still to be considered. And earlier this evening, the opposition, uh, seeking to contrive, uh, sought to contrive, in the absence of any interest in the community outside, uh, in, in the Senate's deliberations tonight, I think the community outside would be concerned to see that the Senate completed its business. That's what they would be concerned about. And uh, well, well, I, I would think that was what the community expected. Ex ex expected. Uh, that's what the community ex would have uh, would have expected of the Senate uh, tonight. But of course, the Senate tonight, uh, the opposition moved a resolution to uh, suspend standing orders. Uh, to enable them to take, you know, on this night, in, in the interest of being seen as being politically virile, uh, to enable them tonight to debate uh, the uh, new prime minister of this country, and and, uh, and Mr. Uh, Mr. President, that was an issue. That was the issue which was before the Senate. Now, Senator Hill gets up and moves subsequent to that, in relation to Senator Kemp's exclusion from the chamber. Senator Hill gets up and moves subsequent to that vote and that debate and that vote that uh, Senator, uh, Senator Colston no longer has the confidence of the Senate and says, I, and says, I move this motion with regret. So he ought to. So he ought to move it with regret because it is unprecedented or almost unprecedented in terms of the deliberations of the Senate. And of course it's unprecedented and uh, almost unprecedented, I'm sorry, and it's done tonight. It's, it's done tonight because of the failure of the previous resolution. Now, uh, Mr. President, Mr. President, <coughs> well, Sen Senator, Senator, Order. Senator Crane, Senator Crane says nonsense. Well, he, he had, uh, <coughs> I, I would have thought uh, his behaviour was transparent, Mr. President. Now, <coughs> Mr. President, uh, in terms of uh, Senator uh, Senator Colston's ruling. Uh, of course, managing a chamber such as this, as Senator Colston was doing, in, in, in very difficult circumstances when there is acrimonious debate taking place in the Senate, is not an easy task. And uh, Senator, the Senator, is, as Deputy President, is entitled to make judgments about these matters, which, unless they are horrendously, uh, horrendously out of line with the standing orders, are judgments are judgments which, uh, which should be respected by the Senate, uh, judgments which should be respected by the Senate and which I believe are respected and were respected by a majority of the Senate. Were, uh, Senator, were respected by a majority of the Senate, and it is a majority of the Senate that is important in determining this issue. So, uh, Mr. Uh, <coughs> Mr. President, uh, Senator Hill made all sorts of uh, allegations about uh, uh, the opposition being unhappy with Senator Colston's performance, not just tonight but on previous occasions. We haven't heard about it before in terms of a resolution. We've not, we've not heard about it. We've, we have not heard about it before in terms of a resolution of this kind. This is the first time this is the first time that a resolution of this kind is moved by the Leader of the Opposition, and it is moved uh, with regret. You know, I was overseas, Senator Macdonald. Brilliant, brilliant conclusion. Don't get, too don't get too excited about that. Now, Mr President, uh, the, the, of course the government will not uh, uh, contemplate this action by the Opposition. We have confidence in the Deputy President of this uh, Senate. The majority of the Senate has confidence in him, and uh, I think the matter be, ought to be resolved as quickly as possible. Senator Alston. Uh, I've been in this chamber now for uh, almost six years, and uh, during that time I've, uh, I have uh, had the opportunity to observe the, the great degree of difficulty and strain that can attach to uh, presiding over the conduct of this chamber. And uh, Senator Doug McClellan, your predecessor, I think performed remarkably well, and on this side there was a very high degree of support and acceptance for his performance. For our own part, we had Senator Hamer as deputy chairman, deputy president, and again, I thought uh, showed a great deal of uh, sense and discretion. 
And uh, you yourself, Mr. President, I have to say, have uh, done, I think, uh, a very good job in uh, almost uh, every situation you've been placed in. There are times, of course, when uh, difficulties arise, and uh, we'll have our disagreements. But by and large, you have demonstrated the flexibility and tolerance that is an essential part of presiding over this chamber. And that's where it is uh, with great regret that we have to say that Senator Colston has simply not measured up to that task. On the one hand, he has sought to uh, throw his weight around in such a way that uh, he, had, makes, he demeans the office of deputy president. He brings the chamber into disrepute by rising inappropriately, uh, quite often ahead of time, and as tonight amply demonstrates, with no regard to the circumstances. Now, one would have thought, if you're in politics, you are acutely sensitive to matters of uh, high drama and indeed melodrama. And if tonight's not one of those occasions when, for the first time in history, the Labor Party's thrown out uh, not only its most successful leader but uh, a prime minister uh, that it's uh, previously regarded very highly, I can't imagine a more uh, charged atmosphere. And yet, Senator Colston purports to act as though this is just another debate just another discussion amongst uh, competing forces and something that uh, doesn't deserve to even have uh, an exchange of, of views, an exchange of interjections, an exchange of laughter. All those things are part of the give and take in this place, part and parcel of making democracy work, and in almost every instance the chair, uh, with you in it in particular, has been flexible enough to allow that to happen. And the great tragedy of Senator Colston's misrule and uh, the way in which he's presided, not, not just on this occasion, but I think amply demonstrated in the way that he reacted with Senator Bohm, was to overreact in the first instance and then make a complete fool of himself by backing off. I mean, if he had any guts, he would have proceeded with the sort of motion that we've been forced to tonight by the treachery of the Democrats. Yeah. Now, if ever there were, if ever there were double not all of them. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree entirely. And, and again, that is a double tragedy because the way Senator, Colston, uh, Senator uh, Coulter performed was such that he didn't even seem to understand the basis. Uh, yes. Well, there's not much honesty at the top in the Democrats, and we've known that for quite some time. But that is that is just part of the side tragedy. But the real tragedy is that we have had in this chamber a deputy president who is clearly incompetent. And it gives us no joy to say that because I think we are all prepared to accept that in the heat of the moment you can make mistakes, that uh, you do need to back off from time to time. Senator Ray tonight I thought was a very good example of that quite clearly, didn't want it matters to go the direction they, that they did. But you had no conception on the part of the deputy president that somehow there was a need to try and resolve the matter. It would have been uh, quite permissible for him to have invited the Democrats to back off or to have uh, somehow accepted the explanation given by uh, Senator Kemp. But indeed, we had, we had a succession of errors on the part of the Deputy President, not even beginning to comprehend that uh, a senator who is entitled to natural justice is entitled to know on what basis he's been warned and then named. Uh, demanding that somehow he had to give a, a, an apology when clearly the standing orders don't require that, uh, not really heeding the explanation given, not being prepared to accept that uh, there were circumstances that would justify overlooking uh, any uh, minor misdemeanour, and that's about as high as you could possibly place it, and again singling out someone that, uh, from where I sat, uh, committed no greater offence than probably half of this chamber tonight. And, and that that is why it's such a sad state of affairs that uh, you don't have the confidence of the chamber when suddenly someone is singled out for behaviour that almost everyone else would regard as fair and reasonable in the, in the fairly highly charged circumstances of the night. And uh, that's where judgment's required. That's where discretion's required. Senator Colston manifestly lacks either of those qualities. He's been given an opportunity over a long period of time to demonstrate that he can learn on the job, that uh, he can uh, use tact and discretion, that he can familiarise himself with standing orders, but what we've found time and again is that he has no understanding of the standing orders, constantly has to have it explained to him by the clerk, and uh, generally demonstrates an inability to handle the affairs of the chamber. And, and that, that is a very sad state of affairs, Mr President, and that's what brings us to the position we're at tonight. 
Um, we, we are very much united behind Senator Kemp. We don't regard him as having committed uh, any offence, certainly not within the terms of uh, Standing Order 203E, persistently and willfully disregarding. I mean, if, if what Senator Kemp did tonight, whether or not you regard it as more than laughing, if that is somehow characterised as persistent and willfully disregarding the chair, we might as well close up shop and go home. Everyone would be guilty of an offence every five minutes. And you know, Mr. President, in question time, in question time, there's a fair bit of give and take. And I don't mind it. And I don't mind giving it. And I don't mind taking it. And by and large, we get by. I mean, some people can't keep quiet for five seconds. They come and say to you, they come and say to you, are you moving an amendment? You say no, and you're told I'm going to speak for no more than 60 seconds. Well, he went for six minutes on that occasion. I, I thought he, you said one minute. One minute, he said. Order. Now, now, that's the sort of uh, thing that we tolerate. And Senator Ray can get up and thump the table and carry on, and we accept it. Senator Richardson can go through the sort of mealy mouth performance we had tonight, and uh, we know he doesn't believe a word of it. We know uh, what sort of machinations that uh, have been undertaken over the last uh, six weeks or so. Again, we cop it. And unless you're prepared to have that spirit, you, this place can't work. And that's why. We're reluctantly driven to the position we take tonight, and uh, Mr. President, I have to say that uh, we cannot go on in this way. You brought matters to a resolution on another issue, because you took the view you simply couldn't go on the way things were, and we take the same view tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Ray, Mr. Uh, President, we've often uh, in this chamber, when we've come to a debate standing orders, often referred to the most important one that's not there, and that's common sense shall prevail. And there's a couple of a um, couple of phrases, couple of phrases uh, that have been used by the uh, two opposition spokesmen tonight. They said uh, today is an extraordinary day. Well, certainly it was. And Senator Olson says there should be a lot of give and take in the chamber, and I agree with that. But I was here for the whole of that debate, and I think in my time in the Senate I haven't heard so much noise coming from one side of the chamber as we did tonight. No, I think that's a, I think that's a fact. And I can understand why, and I don't condemn uh, the reasons for that, uh, that noise and joy. And it wasn't a question, Mr. President. Order. This was not a question tonight of the odd interjection floating across, but an absolute bar barrage. No, not just of laughter, Senator Newman. There are a whole range of things said. The second thing that I think disturbed me in the behaviour tonight is, irrespective of what that side of the chamber, this side of the chamber, may evaluate in a presiding officer. When the presiding officer gets to their feet, there, then there should be silence, and there wasn't tonight. The barrage continued. Well, you see, you say that's justifiable. That Senator Olson says that's just, a, just that you know he's lost the confidence. If, in fact, the chairman gets to his feet because it can't uh, can't uh, establish order, then silence should prevail. You all know that. You know that's the practice, and that's it. It didn't happen tonight. It's been said that Senator Kemp was picked out. I heard Senator Hill warned. I heard Senator McGibbon warned. And I saw Senator Kemp warned. Then later I saw Senator Calvert warned. Uh, well, you say all well on this side. I'm, I say with due respect, Senator Bishop, 95 per cent of the noise tonight, because some of us are a bit down, came from your side. And I, uh, I think that's the case. Now, where this uh, particular issue got away from us, I have to, have to explain to the Senate, and I hope some of the senators agree. Immediately, uh, Senator Kemp was named. Um, well, I think it was myself who made the point that we should hear an explanation. We then started to have a variety of points of order. At, at that point, Senator McMullen intervened, made a contribution, and said, let's get on with it. Everyone on this side, I must say, hold on, everyone on this side, assumed that was the end of the issue. and what I didn't even realise that Senator Calder was talking to the point of order, and then he moved the motion. And, the, and I have to say here, the Deputy President, when you read the standing orders, had no choice but to put it. The standing orders at that stage, it gave us no chance to intervene, us no chance to try to apply some common sense, us to apply some sort of interpretation to what Senator Kemp had said. 
because I took Canada's, Senator Kemp's explanation as probably being sufficient. Order. But we had no alternative. We had no alternative when the motion was put to, in fact, back up the deputy president. Now, uh, people say uh, at that point the deputy president could have backed off. He couldn't. Once the motion is moved, no. Once the motion is moved, the deputy Order. president must put it. Order. Which again goes to the point where traditionally those sort of motions are moved from this end of the, the chamber, traditionally, and very rarely, in some occasions, they move from where Senator Al about where Senator Alston sitting. And that's that tradition, I must say, should continue. However, we have been through an experience before. We have been through an experience before, in which a presiding officer some years ago named a disorderly senator. Uh, and I, uh, I don't comment on the circumstances. And this chamber did not back up. Order. No, 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 no. No, I'm not picking on anyone. I'm not picking on anyone. But this chamber did not back up the presiding officer, and I think this chamber was at fault. Exactly, exactly. We can concede that. Order. Senator I can see that. The chair. But it's very Order. difficult for for most people in the chamber not to back up a presiding officer who has named someone. And uh, that's what occurred here. Now, where do we take it from here, uh, Mr. President? I don't take it as far as to say I have lost confidence in the deputy chair. The other side does. The coalition does. I do not. I've seen him perform some very admirable performances in this chamber on difficult committee stages, complex committee stages, etc. And I again repeat, to me, in my experience in this chamber, I must say tonight was one of the noisiest that I've uh, gone through. No, it is. You know. it, and it, it wasn't really one of those give and take ones this time. There's a lot of given, and we were taking it all on this particular side. Now, uh, you know, some reference was made uh, going back to, uh, to the election or non election of Senator Crichton Brown. I mean, I thought he took his defeat rather well, and I don't think that should intrude on uh, the debate or judgment at all tonight. Uh, uh, because a reference was made from uh, from your side, uh, Senator, uh, by yourself, saying that you know we made a mistake. Uh, Order. Uh, while you were waving bogon moths away, is the way I took it. I just say this, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, in conclusion. I um, I say this, uh, Mr. President, in conclusion. Uh, today has been an interesting day, and I just uh, I just reflect in contrast with the experience I've been through today. <coughs> Where I see someone who has uh, behaved uh, impeccably, honourably, etc., and I come in and see some of this, and I come in and see some of this puerile performance tonight, and I'll remember this day of contrast. A great Australian, uh, whose career ended today, and a pack of puerile performers in this chamber, and uh, that contrast will always stay with me. I do not believe. I do not believe the uh, opposition has made a sufficient case to warrant a motion of this seriousness, but I do believe that uh, at some stage people from this chamber should enter into a dialogue to understand uh, what is within the acceptable bounds of give and take uh, in the chamber. And there should be, as Senator Orson is right, there should be a fair latitude. It doesn't come to a point, though, I think, you'd, you'd agree, Senator Orson, to a total shouting down of someone trying to deliver a speech in this particular chamber. It bordered on that. Had it been a speaker other than Senator Richardson, who's got a pretty loud voice, they would have had absolutely no chance of being heard in this chamber. Absolutely no chance whatsoever. Mr. President, this is a serious, uh, this is a serious step by the opposition to move. Senator Hill has acknowledged how serious it is. I don't believe the case is sufficient, but I do think common sense should prevail more often in this chamber rather than a quick resort to standing orders, and that we should at some stage, and we're probably too tired in this period to have some sort of discussion as to how the chair's authority is reinforced, especially when the chair is on their feet calling for order. Senator, point of order. To be misrepresented, I seek leave to make a brief statement in respect to that matter. Is leave granted? Senator Crichton Brown. Mr President, I've just put it for the record because the, the presumably flippant manner in which it was put by Senator Ray won't reflect in the hand side. Senator Ray I thought implied that there had been some motive from somebody on this side of the chamber 
to move this motion on the basis of Senator Colston defeating Senator Crichton Brown for the Deputy Presidency. I would hope that Senator Ray will acknowledge for the benefit of the Hansard that no mischievous intent was in his mind, because it certainly has not been implied from this side, nor would it be. And I like to think that all of us accept the decisions of this chamber with good grace and understanding. And I, I'd be deeply personally offended if, if I thought Senator if I thought Senator Ray were. I wonder why I just finished this, Mr. President. Without yes, order, order. I'd, I'd ask Senator Collins and Senator Walters to stop interjecting. Oh. Oh. Senator Crichton. Thank Brown. you, Mr. President. I'd, I'd be grateful if, if Senator Ray would acknowledge that he wasn't impugning that or imputing that in any way. I so acknowledge and ask leave to have that put on the record. Senator Ray, Senator Bell. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> In the contributions so far from the coalition, part of the defence which has been offered has been that laughing was a natural response to the situation, or that it was a minor misdemeanour, or that it was a fair response. And that description has also been turned around to offer part criticism of the, uh, the deputy. Much of that is a matter of opinion so far. I'd like to offer two facts. Two facts which I think uh, myself and Senator Coulter are privy to, and perhaps nobody else on the, nobody on the, uh, the government bench and nobody else in the, uh, in the debate so far has acknowledged. The fact one was that I was standing next to Senator Kemp while he was chuckling and not disrupting the chamber but simply chuckling. Fact number two, I was still standing next to Senator Kemp when Senator O'Chi introduced a deliberate strategy of disruption. Senator O'Chi gave an instruction to not only Senator Kemp but several others, and I challenge, I challenge, <coughs> I challenge Senator O'Chi to deny that he said, and I quote, and I quote, keep laughing, they can't chuck you out for laughing. End of quote. Senator O'Chi orchestrated he danced from one place to another in a deliberate strategy which showed disrespect to this chamber and in particular provoked Senator Kemp to not laugh but to in fact make loud disruptive noises which mimicked laughter but which served only to disrupt this place and to interrupt the legislative processes. I submit, Mr President, that what we saw from Senator Kemp was part of a process orchestrated by Senator O'Chi, something which we saw from this end of the chamber and which disgusted us to such an extent that we thought it should be stopped so we could get on with the legislative process. Senator, Senator O'Chi. Order. Well, we will deal with Order. That Order, Senator Macdonald. Senator O'Chi. We will deal with that interjection in a minute, Senator Bell, because I take umbrage at that suggestion. But the, uh, the comment I make, uh, Mr President, is that Senator Bell did not hear what I said correctly, and I want to put it on the record what I did say, because I make not one effort to resile from what I have said, and it is very simply this, that we cannot interject but there is nothing to stop us from laughing, and I was laughing genuinely, as many of the members on this side of the chamber were doing. And for Senator Bell to come in here and perform another stunt, hot on the heels of the one we have seen, is, I find, personally offensive. And now to be accused by Senator Bell of lying, Mr. President, is even worse. Is even worse. And I say. That if Senator Bell has a problem with his hearing, then so be it. But I don't want him coming in here and trying this stunt on me, because I will not tolerate, tolerate it, and that is why I ought to put it on the record right here and now, so we can get on with this debate about a very substantive point. But Senator Bell is in here to score cheap shots. We are not. I challenge you to deny it. You didn't. Senator Haradine. <clears throat> Mr President. Uh, the motion that is before the chamber is a very serious motion indeed. It is a motion that suggests that the Senate 
has uh, no confidence in the Deputy President. It's a motion that uh, <clears throat> in all of the 16 years that I've been here, I don't think I've heard uh, of uh, such a motion. Um, it's a motion that I believe that should be uh, supported by far more evidence than I've heard thus far. It should uh, reflect a <laughs> continuous discontent by uh, a majority of this chamber over the actions of the Deputy President, uh, such that would lead to such a, uh, a motion. Now, I haven't heard uh, that, um, uh, that um, uh, evidence uh, thus far. I don't think that, the, uh, that this motion uh, is appropriate to be moved because of one incident. Now, I must confess to the chamber that I left this, par this uh, house at uh, around about five or ten minutes to seven this evening uh, to attend a commitment outside of the chamber, uh, thinking that the uh, transport uh, bill would still be before the chamber when I got back. I got back here, I think, around about 25 or 20 to nine. Um, the car having picked me up at about quarter past eight, and the bells were ringing. I got to the, uh, I, I just about made it to the door, um, and uh, then I heard the reason that the bells were ringing was for a, a motion uh, that uh, Senator Bell, uh, uh, Senator um, uh, Hills, a motion to uh, suspend standing orders. So I wasn't aware of what had occurred before then. I wasn't in the chamber to observe um, uh, what happened insofar as Senator, uh, um, uh, Senator Kemp was concerned. Now clearly, if there were concerns about what occurred then, the uh, clear um, uh, response would be to vote against uh, uh, the particular motion. Uh, that was uh, presumably moved on that occasion, and uh, thus register uh, your disagreement uh, with uh, the uh, action that had been taken. Whether that act, where you're registering disagreement against the action of the deputy president, or whether you're registering your disagreement with the action of the uh, of the person who moved the actual motion. And thus, you're registering your disagreement uh, uh, with the motion itself. Now, that's when the uh, well, well, you've already done that, uh, as I understand it. The opposition has registered uh, its objection to the action that's been taken, either by the deputy president or by the person who moved the motion. But uh, there has only been one reference made by the opposition. Uh, tonight, there's been general statements made about um, uh, about the deputy president's uh, um, uh, efficiency or otherwise in the job. General statements, no specific uh, mention, except about the occasion a couple of weeks ago. Now, uh, that occasion, I thought, was dealt with sensibly by the chamber. I thought it was dealt with sensibly by Senator Bohm, and I thought it was dealt with sensibly by the uh, uh, Deputy President when he was chairman of the committee. It was a very difficult situation, and I observed and I thought that it was dealt with sens sensibly. Now, I've um, then served in this chamber, uh, and uh, uh, during those years, I suppose there's been four or five uh, Deputy Presidents. Uh, uh, that have been that have occupied that uh, persons that have occupied the position of deputy president, and one of the functions of deputy president, of course, is that of chairman of committees. And if you've got no confidence in the deputy president, you haven't got confidence in him as chairman of committees. Well, I, well, I want to stand here and say that. His performance as chairman of committees is as equal, equally good, if not better than any of those other deputy presidents that have served. He has been an intelligent, 
sensitive, considerate, tolerant and efficient deputy uh, uh, chairman of committees. And uh, I, I certainly would not support uh, the resolution on the basis of the evidence that has been presented to us. I, I apologise for not being here tonight, but even if I were here tonight, you could not support this uh, resolution on the basis of one single incident. There's got to be a pattern of virtual misbehaviour by the Deputy President for such a motion uh, to, to be supported uh, and accepted by the Chamber. And, uh, I certainly don't believe that that pattern, pattern of behaviour is there. Senator Archer. I too regard this as a matter of considerable seriousness. And you, Mr. President, Mr. Deputy President and myself, along with Senator Harradine and Senator Walters, all started in this place on the same day. Now, we've had enough experience between us to know how this place operates and what sort of give and take is necessary to make it operate. Senator Ray produced the solution for what was going on tonight. But because of ignorance and stupidity and short-sightedness and one-upmanship, it didn't get the opportunity to work. Now, that is the real problem we are facing tonight. Section Clause 203, infringement of order, which was what caused this problem tonight, is, is fairly simple and straightforward. It says that a senator who has been reported as having committed an offence, and I've previously gone through the various offences, shall attend in the senator's place and be called upon to make an explanation or apology. Or apology. And then a motion may be moved that the senator be suspended from the sitting of the Senate. Senator Kemp very adequately made an explanation which would have been perfectly acceptable to you, Mr President, and would have been perfectly acceptable to Mr Deputy President. Perfectly acceptable. There was never any doubt about the nature of the explanation that was given by Senator Kemp. But here, this body tonight, through arrant stupidity, has put a plaster on Senator Kemp for the rest of his life that he got thrown out of the Senate for misconduct. That's what's happened as a result of some stupidity from further down the line. Now, I do object to that. I object to that far more than I object to the fact that we're dealing with, with a, a, a motion of, of uh, no confidence at the moment. It is a day of high emotion. I accept the fact that history has been made today, today and we're all part of it. Now, we don't often fit into this place when real history is made, but today is one of those days. There is a lot of emotion on both sides. There's a lot of emotion of conflict on either side, particularly on the other side. But this isn't the way to deal with it. And I just feel that you know, what, a, what a terrible thing we've done today as far as Senator Kemp is concerned. If you can get thrown out of the Senate for laughing, you couldn't get thrown out of the Senate in, uh, uh, in any place I can think of. Probably Ethiopia, you wouldn't. In Mongolia, you wouldn't. You know, where would you? Where would you get thrown out for laughing? And I don't think for an instant that Senator Colston would have thrown Senator Kemp out of the Senate for laughing. Now, whatever else. But I wouldn't have thought that the people opposite would have voted to throw him out either. And that's where the problem lies. Absolutely. Why did you mob over there vote to throw him out? You stupid lot. Look what you've done now. Order. Apart from the fact that you've Order. now got, It's half past nine at present. 
We could have started at 8 o'clock. But because you wanted to play your games as a means of getting rid of the, the tension that you've built up during the day, it's half past nine. Now, really, why can't we do something that can review this stupid decision that we've suffered and get on with the business like we're supposed to? Senator Alston was talking about a bit of give and take. Now, that's what it's all about. Senator Ray was on about it. But why Senator Coulter? wanted to be the main figure in the act today, and so this is where we wind up. And that's what happens. Now, really, Mr President, can't we do something to reverse this decision and get on with the business of the day? Senator McMullen. Order. The, the question is that the question be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Order. Order.
Lock the doors. The question is that the question be now put. The ayes will pass the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Foreman teller for the ayes and Senator Brownhill teller for the nose. Order. Result of the division there being 32 ayes and 29 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. Order. The question now is that the motion moved by Senator Hill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Hill be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Brownhill teller for the ayes and Senator Foreman teller for the nose. Order.
Order. Result of the division there being 28 ayes and 34 noes. The question is resolved in the negative. Would all senators please resume their seats? Would all senators please resume their seats? Senator Hill. Uh, Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion uh, forthwith, um, a motion of rescission of the, of the resolution suspending Senator Kemp, uh, and I need leave, because otherwise I'd be bound by the uh, notice requirements in Standing Order 87. Yeah. You do need leave. Is leave granted? Before, Senator I Collins. I, I wonder if I could also seek the leave of the House. Um, because I'm somewhat taken aback by the suggestion that's been made, and I'll only speak for one minute. Mr. President, uh, can, can I, I, honourable senators, I please resume their seats. Mr. President, um, I'll be one minute. Uh, Mr. President, I, I wasn't aware of the of the actual nature of the, the motion that uh, Senator Hill uh, intended to move tonight, and uh, I don't know, frankly, what Senator Colston's reaction that, uh, to this would be. But the situation was this evening, and I'll be very brief, and Senator Ray, I thought, very, uh, very effectively uh, uh, put it down, is that I thought, uh, frankly, I agreed with Senator Ray, and I did so by interjection, I thought the Senate suspended tonight, in fact, gave a very proper and gracious uh, response. Um, Senator Coulter, of course, actually moved the suspension. Um, what I would suggest, Mr President, is that— Correct. Mr President, what I would suggest, and I know that the Senate is certainly capable of doing this with your advice on how we do it, is that uh, a resolution to this, and I think it's appropriate after six weeks on the last night, is that the suspension against the Senator for, uh, for the service of the House be rescinded and that the motion against uh, uh, the Deputy President uh, be withdrawn. And is, I would seek leave to move. Uh, is leave granted to Senator Hill? Senator Hill sought leave to move a yes, motion. Yes, but on the right? first part. Well, it can be done by leave if uh, you wish to move it, I think, Senator Collins. Mr President, I seek leave to move the motion I foreshadow. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Collins. Mr President, I move that the suspension from the service of the House of Senator Crane be rescinded. Senator, Senator Kemp. It has, been, it has been a long six weeks. Order. I, I move, Mr President, You're lucky, the, Senator Crane. That the, <laughs> that the suspension from the service of the House of uh, Senator Kemp uh, be rescinded and that the motion uh, of no confidence uh, against the Deputy uh, President of the Senate be withdrawn. Senator Hill. Um, I want to express it in this way, if I'm speaking to the motion that uh, has been moved by, by Senator Collins. Um, certainly, I think uh, the motion of rescission that I wish to move, I sought to do so because I listened carefully to what Senator Ray said, uh, and I got the impression that, uh, that it was his view and therefore the view of um, government members that the offence of laughing uh, was not disorderly conduct or abuse of the chair or, or anything that, uh, that justified, uh, justified being thrown out. And I thought it therefore sensible, particularly in the uh, unprecedented circumstance when the motion to suspend him wasn't in fact moved by the, by the government member but by a member of uh, a third minority party, that the Senate should give, uh, should give further consideration to, the, uh, uh, to that um, unusual course of action of um, suspending Senator Kemp for laughing in the chamber. It certainly seemed to us uh, that that was warranted, that a reconsideration was want warranted, and that's why I was seeking leave to move that immediately. And the minister has uh, has taken the procedure and done so, and that part of the motion that uh, that we'll support. With regard to the 
withdrawal of our, our motion of no confidence, um, it puts us in a very difficult um, position that I'll try to explain, Mr. President. As was said on both sides of the chamber, the action to move a motion of no confidence in the deputy chair is don't wave your arms around is is something is something that shouldn't be an action that shouldn't be taken without very serious consideration. And very serious consideration was taken. We were of the view that the conduct of the deputy chairman was such that he should no longer have the confidence of this chamber. My discomfort is by complying with, uh, with this and trying to uh, meet the spirit of Christmas and so forth. It may well appear that uh, we now regard our action as not of that uh, consequence, and I'm not going to take any. I'm not going to uh, take any position in this place that in any way withdraws the gravity with which we believe the matter we believe of this matter uh, and our justification in moving the motion that we moved and well it, it, it doesn't quite apply to the suspension because I think around the chamber people are generally of the opinion and genuinely of the opinion that it was a miscarriage of justice. Well, I listened to Senator Ray, and Senator Ray, in effect, might come back. But Senator Ray, I think, in effect, indicated that uh, the Labor Party felt they were locked in to protect the deputy president once Senator Coulter had taken this incredible, incredible Stupid. action. Stupid. And, uh, and I got the impression that what Senator Ray was saying was that it wasn't a hanging offence and that course of action shouldn't have really been taken, but that he didn't have any choice once Senator Coulter had taken the action that he, that he did. And I think Senator Ray regretted uh, what had occurred. And that's why I wanted the chamber to reconsider what it had done, uh, and I wanted Senator Coulter to reconsider the action that he'd taken, because I would like to think on further, further reflection he would think that that wasn't a sensible course of action to take. And it wasn't, certainly wasn't a course of action that was going to result in the, the type of uh, environment that's necessary to make this place function in the future. And I like, would have liked him to have the opportunity to consider that. But what the minister has done, however, is ask us to also withdraw the motion that we've just, uh, just lost. Now, I'm not too sure how you do that in any event. Um, it, may not, uh, it may not be possible. Uh, I'm, uh, we accept we lost that vote. The, ch the chamber has confidence in the deputy president, notwithstanding the very serious point of view that we put to the chamber, and we accept that. And uh, uh, we're, we're in business. We're in business with Senator Colston in the future, and he will continue to get respect in the future in the way that we would give respect to any president or deputy president that has the confidence of this place. But I don't think, Minister, the more I think about it, that you can ask us to take a course of action now that would indicate that we didn't hold the, the action that we took earlier with the level of gravity in which we did in fact Absolutely. hold it. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm not sure with this unusual procedure that you moved how uh, we get ourselves out of that. But if, you've, if, you're, if you're waving your hand to suggest that you have a solution, I look forward to hearing it. I seek leave to speak again, Senator Collins. I seek leave, Mr. President, to speak very leave briefly. Granted. Um, and I, I do granted. have to acknowledge I'm indebted to Senator McMullen for the suggestion. Um, Mr. President, I, I'm obviously entirely in your hands, uh, but I, I'm uh, grateful to hear the, uh, the views of Senator Hill on this. Um, what Senator Mullen, McMullen has suggested is that uh, the procedural problem I had not recognised, Senator Hill, and I think you're correct, is that perhaps. Um, a, uh, a, a motion of the chamber can be moved, leaving the vote stand as it is, uh, in a more positive way, and that is that the suspension of Senator Kemp uh, be withdrawn and uh, that the House uh, affirms its confidence uh, in the Deputy President. Order. 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 Senator Alston.
Mr. President, uh, what, what Senator Collins is proposing is um, an attempt to somehow rewrite the entire course of recent history. And I really don't think, if we are in a spirit of compromise, that it is necessary to go to that point. No, no one wants to reopen wounds. No one wants to traverse the same ground. All we are saying, I think, uh, on this, at this end of the uh, chamber is that, uh, in the circumstances, it, we are warranted in reconsidering the position we took in relation to Senator Kemp. Other than that, let bygones be bygones. We've uh, put our point of view in relation to the Deputy President. We've lost. We accept the consequences of that, which are that there is no uh, motion of uh, no confidence or censure. We will continue to uh, treat Senator Colston with all the respect that uh, the position deserves, and uh, there is therefore no reason for resiling in the way that Senator Collins would suggest. And I don't think that e either of us are wanting to go back over all of that ground, and I think we can very simply get to the point we want to get to. Senator McMullen. Mr. President, this is frustrating in that we are very close to agreement. I, I understand the sense in which Senators Hill and Alston have spoken and uh, Senator Collins, and we are uh, we're seeking to do two things in this discussion. And if we, can do, if we can find a formula to do both things, we will be in agreement and get on with the business. What, what the government will not agree to is any resolution which indicates in the slightest way that we do not have full confidence in the Deputy President. What, in whatever manner... No, I under... Yeah, but... Thank you. I do understand that. It's helpful. It's very helpful. Well, there is absolutely no sense in saying to us that we will do only one thing, which is, uh, lift the, uh, is go to the rescission of the suspension of Senator Kemp. We will not do that you, by itself. I understand the point, and both Senator Ray and I, in speaking, to, uh, in speaking in response to the explanation offered by Senator Kemp, indicated some sympathy for uh, the fact that perhaps uh, with some further action on his part a way out might have been found. But the resolution has been moved and we support, supported and support the Deputy President and continue to do so. But Senator Archer, in speaking uh, in the debate, made some points which I think everybody would I didn't agree with all of it, of course, because he got stuck into our side of the house. I didn't agree with that part of it, and that's fair enough. But he was making some comments about uh, the uh, impact of this upon Senator Kemp, and if there is a manner in which something can be done that in no way reflects upon the, the standing and support of the government for the Deputy President. Uh, while dealing with uh, that perceived problem, which we appreciate, uh, is held on the opposition side. We are prepared to try and find that. Comp we are prepared to try and find that compromise, but it needs to have two elements. It ne you can the form of words of the second element is something that is negotiable, but I think we need to find that. And can I suggest, uh, Senator Hill, that it, Senator Hill? that it may be that we need a little more time to discuss the form of words in which this manner is resolved. And if you think some further discussion may do that, I might suggest the debate on this motion be adjourned to, uh, until a later hour this day. So I, I'm prepared to accept dealing with it. I understand what you're trying to achieve. But, uh, but uh, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to do that if you think discussion will find the form of words that will allow both points to be achieved. If it will not, we will simply uh, oppose your motion, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move. I move that debate on this matter be adjourned to a later hour. Well, I, well, I, I thought that was a good suggestion. There'd been a order. Order. There'd been a speaker from the government side. I call Senator Bishop. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I find out what resolution is before the chair because I still think it's Senator Collins. Well, I'm speaking to the to the to the res, to the motion moved by Senator Collins, which he's moved in two parts. And uh, by listening to Senator McMullen, he is saying that he will agree to a uh, rescission motion, provided he gets his way, uh, and that somehow there is a vote of confidence in uh, uh, Senator Colston. 
Quite clearly, that is unacceptable on this side for the reason that we, in all, in all honesty and sincerity, moved that motion out of sadness and slow anger as much as anything else, and with a desire to see somebody put out of their misery. All right. It is a situation that we have been experienced over the time, and indeed I am seeking the, uh, to uh, examine the, uh, the Hansard at the moment and will bring back to this place a list of the people who have been warned by Senator Colston over a period of time. And I know that when it comes to light they will all be virtually people on this side of the House and not on that side of the House. And part and parcel of this question of confidence is one of respect, and you earn respect in the chair by having an even-handed and, and uh, reasonable approach, that is, the approach of a reasonable man. Now, anybody who saw, and we have access to video replay in this place, and anyone who had a look at the video replay would see uh, that many of the rulings that we are uh, that have led to the moving of this motion, or rather, led to the moving of the earlier motion, were ones that have come out of anger from the chair, and that is clearly not an acceptable way in which to manage this chamber. Now, in speaking to the motion as moved by Senator Collins uh, and the one foreshadowed by Senator Hill, and that is simply to move the rescission motion, I think it is fair and reasonable uh, that the motion be rescinded. As Senator Colston rose in his place and asked Senator Coulter if he would repeat what he said because he did not hear it the first time, and if he had listened more attentively, attentively to what Senator Ray had to say, who was offering him the way out and he simply didn't have the ability to accept that offer and rule that way. And in his anger, which is so obvious every time you look at a replay of the way that these incidents arise, you will see that he asked Senator Coulter to uh, repeat the motion that he had moved and really got himself into the mess. Now, it is quite unreasonable for Senator Collins to ask this side of the chamber, who, as I said, moved the motion out of both a long sense of burning anger and injustice and a sense of sadness to see a man in a position where he is unable to cope. And I think, Mr President, that if Senator Collins could uh, see his way clear to put his motions into two parts, i.e. two motions, uh, then we would be able to vote accordingly. Otherwise, we ought to have Senator Hill's motion as he has sought leave and be able to vote on that. Senator Collins, I seek leave to withdraw my motion and to make a short statement to, as to why I wish to do so. Is leave granted? Mr. 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 Deputy. Order. Uh, Senator Hill, is leave granted? I'll be one minute. He's seeking be one leave minute. to withdraw his motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I, th I thought we. Certainly. Yes, I, yes, we will. But we're not going to. No. Yes, yes, we will. But we're not going to have a long debate. No, we're not. Yes, we will, Senator Hill. Mr. President, uh, leave granted. Leave's granted. Senator Collins. Mr. Mr. President, I deeply regret the contribution that has just been made by Senator Bishop, who, in fact, said in the Hansard will shut, purported at least to speak on behalf of the, the opposition. She said, "We will not agree," etc. Now, I just point out, in terms of in terms of the suggestion Senator Bishop has made, Mr. President, uh, and which is about to be moved in uh, in a motion that's going to be put by uh, Senator Hill, which we will oppose, and I think rightly and justifiably. I think we're perhaps indebted um, to Senator Haradine, uh, because I got this third hand for the, for the original suggestion is to try to get a peaceful resolution to this. And I just point out to all senators, Mr. President, that the question of the um, suspension of uh, the senator from the chamber, I mean, Senator Bishop seems to think there is no concession on this side of the House at all. We're simply asking for one from the opposition. That is absurd. The suspension of that senator was carried by a vote of the Senate. The Senate voted to suspend the senator. Mr. Mr. President, I, I, in good faith, offered a solution which, frankly— Order. Oh, look, it'll only take me 30 seconds to finish. Which, in good faith, I frankly think the, the good majority of the Senate were prepared to support. But it puts us in an impossible position, Mr. President, if that concession on this side of the House—and I thought it was a reasonable one—to uh, withdraw the suspension of uh, the senator uh, was uh, only uh, agreed by the opposition, and they were not prepared. Uh, and Senator Bishop has, uh, has said it. We will not agree to withdraw any lack of confidence on this side of the chamber in the deputy president. And in so, I, with great regret, 
with great regret, Mr. President, for that reason, I withdraw the motion and I indicate, for the reasons I've just given, I think reasonably, the government will be voting against uh, the, uh, the motion about to be put uh, by Senator Hill and so that the suspension will stand. Senator Hill. Well, I, I move the, uh, the motion that the decision of the, the resolution yes, of the Senate— Seek leave. Seek leave. Well, leave's I, granted. Leave's granted. Senator Hill. I move the motion that the suspension of Senator Kemp be— uh, the, the resolution to suspend Senator Kemp be rescinded. Uh, and uh, I do so for the reasons that uh, I've said a few minutes ago. And with regard to the, the issue of the, of the uh, Deputy President, I again repeat also what I said a few minutes ago, and that is that the Chamber has resolved confidence in Senator Colston. We respect the decision of the Chamber and we respect the office of Deputy President and he can expect that respect from us when he returns to the chair. Now, I don't, I don't think that you can ask us to do any more than that. And I've put that on the record. And in those circumstances, I urge you to reconsider your view on the rescission. And I urge you to recognise, accept, that the decision to throw Senator Kemp out tonight was wrong, and it was an exercise that should be, should be put behind us. And that's why I give you this opportunity, whilst demonstrating, while demonstrating respect for the chair. I give you the opportunity to reconsider this uh, this this issue recognising, I think, in the spirit of what Senator Ray said, and that is that it really wasn't a hanging offence. It wasn't an offence that warranted Senator Kemp being suspended. It diminishes the Senate. Read to the whole decision. Just read it. I give you the opportunity to reconsider, and I give Senator Coulter the opportunity to reconsider the action that he's taken. There's a chance, there's a chance oh, to get God. things right tonight in the end. And the way to get things right in the end is to rescind the motion of suspension, allow Senator Kemp to, to return, to accept that what we have said, and that is that we, we always show respect for the chair and will continue to show respect for the chair and will show respect for the office of Deputy President. In that light, I urge you to reconsider the attitude that you seem to be indicating by shaking your head. Senator, Senator Coulter. President, I don't need to remind you, Mr. President, that uh, the conduct of this chamber is only possible if there is respect for the chair, for the rulings of the chair, for the orders of the chair, and reasonable decorum in the chamber. When Senator Bishop was speaking, she simply proved her own uh, her own side's misbehaviour because she said that Senator Colston could not hear what was going on. The reason that Senator Colston could not hear what was going on, there was so much puerile and infantile rabble going on over here amongst the, the opposition. A number of, a number of opposition uh, senators had been named, and clearly, clearly contrary to what Senator Hill point has just order. said, the opposition was showing no respect, order, no respect whatsoever order. for the chair. Sit down. Now, the order. reason— sit down. I, order. Mr. President, I order. do— I'll tell people when to sit down. Senator Panizza. Yeah, Mr. President, I do believe that Senator Kilder used the word rabble towards us. I believe that it is unparliamentary, and I believe that you should ask him to withdraw it. Order, order. As I said in a letter to you the other day, Senator Panizza, I did consider it unparliamentary, and therefore I'll ask Senator Coulter to withdraw it. But a lot's been said tonight about give and take, and clearly, if on my left, and I haven't pulled it up because of the tenseness of the debate, I've heard expressions like sewer rats and a sleazy mob in reference to, a, to the party that you're now taking the point of order. Now, I'll ask Senator Collar to withdraw, and I'd ask everybody to have a better sense of behaviour. Thank you, Mr President. I'll withdraw that remark. The, uh, the opposition were extremely rowdy. Uh, they were disruptive. And in my opinion, the um, Deputy President was entirely, entirely justified in calling to order a number of senators and the opposition. Now, we in the Democrats are fed up 
with its constant interjection and the dis disruptive, disruptive behaviour which prevents the proper conduct of the operation of this chamber. And I personally was driven to the action that I took tonight, and I think the, the motion— Look, if, Mr. Mr. Lord, President, order. if the if the opposition are going to continue to behave like this, well then I will continue. I will continue to use that section 203 because uh, it seems to me that they need to be taught a lesson. If if we're going to get on with the business, the business of this chamber, the fact that it might not have been used uh, very often in the past seems to me to be quite irrelevant. If it's not going to be used, why have it in the standing orders? Now it seems to me that Senator Collins' motion was entirely reasonable. What I was doing was attempting to uphold the, the, the proper order of this chamber, the rulings, the rulings of the deputy, uh, the deputy president, and I will continue to do that. And consequently, I'm pleased to, to note that uh, in, in the light of what the opposition are uh, refusing to do, that Senator Collins has withdrawn his motion, and we will be guided by his action in that. Senator Walters. Mr. President, said, being said earlier than, uh, tonight, Senator Harradine, Senator Archer and myself have been here now for just over 16 years. Mr. President, in that time, we have only had, as far as I can remember, one person thrown out and not on this side of the chamber. Brown. Not on this side of the chamber. Two, two, yeah. in fact, two people, Macklin. both from the Labor uh, benches. On every occasion, and indeed, Mr. President, when there was a threat that I'd be thrown out, not for unparliamentary language, I don't believe, when I said that uh, one of the ministers was a disgrace to Her Majesty's government, it was ruled unparliamentary, but I didn't believe it, sir, and I refused to withdraw. But at least I was given, and everyone else who has ever been thrown out of this place has been given the opportunity to first explain and then an opportunity to apologise. Now, I'm sure Senator Harradine will back me in that. They have never been refused the opportunity to apologise. On this occasion, Senator Kemp was asked we will have the Hansard tomorrow, to explain. He was not asked by the Deputy President Never. to apologise Never. Never. at any stage. Now, when that was pointed out and Senator uh, Kemp ex made his explanation, as soon as that was completed, Senator Colston said, I want you to apologise. I didn't hear you apologise. Now, there was a general call from our side that it had not been sought. Before he had the opportunity of seeking an apology from Senator Kemp, Senator Coulston, Coulter, Senator Coulter rose and usurped the position of the government. Never before in this place has anyone but the leader of the government sought the suspension of a senator, be it from either the Labor government or the Liberal government. Never before has some minority group usurped the position of the government, leader of the government. But because he chose to act so stupidly and to try and usurp the position, rightly taken by a government in that position, we reached the stage where all the efforts of Senator Ray to pour oil on troubled waters at that stage were undercut and to no avail. Now, all I can say is that if the Democrats want to grandstand in the way they have tonight, except Senator Kernow, who voted with us because she also saw that the Democrats had undercut Senator Ray in his efforts to overcome the problem we had, <coughs> then we will always get into this situation. The Senate is only run according to the standing orders and tradition. And I would like to press the and tradition part. Because, Mr President, once you depart from tradition, as has occurred tonight, then you will always run into trouble. 
I'm quite sure that Senator Herodin would agree, and had he been here, I doubt whether we would have lost that vote, because never before has there been a situation where a senator has been thrown out of the Senate without first being given the opportunity to apologise. And that is what occurred tonight. Senator Kearney. Uh, Mr President, uh, <coughs> whether we could come back to the, to the mood that perhaps uh, provided the Chamber at the start of this, and I can understand everybody getting a bit offside, but um, <coughs> I think uh, Senator uh, Hill put forward a proposition which I think uh, needed discussion. I think it was answered by uh, Senator uh, Collins and, and, and Senator McMullen, and <coughs> I thought we were progressing fairly well along a, uh, a peaceful path where we all sort of saw ourselves as senators who wanted to get rid of a problem, and uh, we seem to have moved a bit away from that to where we're uh, getting a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, curt with each other. Uh, Senator Coulter, I think, has uh, done what he uh, thought right. Uh, Senator uh, Colson uh, is, is perhaps bruised by what's happened, and I suppose the one that's suffering most is Senator Kemp. And I'm beginning to wonder whether what we're not doing is sacrificing uh, those three people uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the speeches we're making, the shafts we're throwing across the chamber. Uh, I was just wondering whether a Senate, with the people that are all as intelligent as we all are, can't come to some sort of compromise position. I thought perhaps. Uh, one thing might be to adjourn, perhaps let the, uh, the uh, whips or somebody else or anybody, somebody brilliant like Senator Bohm come forward with some sort of compromise. Oh, you're about to do that, Senator Bohm. Well, there you are. And, uh, well, I, I think in those circumstances, and since we are coming to reason, uh, that it, uh, I'll sit down and let the, the, the reconciler come forth, uh, Senator Bohm. Senator Bohm. I thank uh, I thank Senator Kearney, Mr. President, for uh, uh, for his uh, support, uh, which is uh, uh, even more strenuous and effective than on the tennis court. But, um, <laughs> uh, Mr. President, the problem clearly has emerged, as everyone has said, because of the precipitate action of uh, uh, an unprecedented action of the Australian Democrats. I don't want to go into that matter because it's uh, been well dealt with. The problem is, and I have to say that I have some feeling for Senator Colston on this matter, the problem is simply that before Senator Colston had the opportunity to consider, to consider the explanation by Senator Kemp, before he was given that opportunity, it was snatched away by precipitate action by the Australian Democrats. Now, clearly, clearly, the way out of this, which seems to me to uh, resolve all problems, is that the rescission motion uh, uh, as uh, set by, uh, by uh, uh, Senator Hill should be accepted, but that, and that would then give uh, 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 Senator Colston the opportunity to determine whether or not he would accept, and whether or not. Mr. President, there's no assumption either way that he would or he would not, but that he'd be given the opportunity to, us to determine an opportunity he was denied, an opportunity to determine whether he would accept Senator Kemp's explanation. When he had made that decision, then it would be up to the, uh, up to the Parliament, up to the Senate, and I had uh, Senator Collins might, uh, uh, might take this on board. It would then be up to the uh, Senate, having heard the manner in which Senator Colston could make his, would make his determination, and if his determination were, for example, to accept the explanation of Senator Kemp, then it would be up to the Senate to move a motion supporting the decision of the Deputy President to, in, to accept Senator Kemp's explanation. Now we've got to recognise, we've got to recognise that to an extent, the opposition's feelings of grievance emerged from the fact that it appeared 
that Senator Colston had not taken into account the explanation which was asked for and very properly given, and which, as Senator uh, Ray indicated, was one that was, quotes, acceptable, and, uh, and Senator Collins said was, quotes, acceptable. Now, and that's the thing. It is unfair to Senator Colston that he was not given the opportunity. He should be given that opportunity, and I believe it would then be proper for the Senate, having heard whatever Senator Colston then determined, either well, in, in the event that he did accept that explanation, to move a motion which I hope would be carried unanimously, supporting the decision of the Deputy President to accept Senator Kemp's explanation. Now, that seems to me to be an indication of support for the ultimate decision taken by the Deputy President, if that were his decision. I don't want to prejudge it. But it seems to me ridiculous that we can't get together on a simple issue like this uh, in, in a matter which I would hope would firstly resolve this waste of time and secondly present at least some evidence of goodwill at this time of the year. I to make a very brief statement in response to Senator Bowen's uh, contribution, which is, leave is, granted. is positive. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Senator McMullen. Uh, Mr uh, President, at, at this moment and in that particular form of words, I'm not sure that Senator Bohm has exactly the solution we're looking for, but it seems to me it is back in the spirit which we were pursuing when Senators Hill uh, and Alston had spoken. And I reiterate my previous suggestion that we should adjourn this discussion so that we can have a discussion about a form of words that will resolve it and get on with the business of, running, of passing legislation and come back this evening with, a, with an agreed yeah, form yeah. of words to resolve it. And I move that the debate on Senator Hill's motion be adjourned. To a later hour this day. The, qu yeah, the question is that the debate be adjourned to a later hour of the day. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The eyes have it.